This week on The Handle. In the last of a three-part series on the city's in-depth neighborhood plans, get a new look at San Jacinto and the historic Route 66 area with its own healing mission. Plus, meet the folks behind a movement to clean the city. All of this right now on Panhandle PBS as we tell the stories of the Texas Panhandle. I've heard a lot of stories. I've heard that uh, you used to be like, you know, middle class and very, very beautiful here. And then all of a sudden it just, you know, went down. Well, the vision for this house has always been, uh, this is our, our outreach, or is this neighborhood. We no longer do, you know, out of state or out of the country or anything like that. We just focus all of our resources to this neighborhood. So when we heard about this plan, it was good to know that, you know, more help was coming. And so we just jumped on it right away because we knew we wanted to be involved in the whole process. It's actually our third neighborhood plan. So we kicked it off with a consultant, which is the first time I've used a consultant um, through this planning process. So we're about halfway through the plan now since starting in January and hope to have it adopted by February of next year. This one's probably been the most successful. From my understanding, we've had over 100 at multiple public meetings. So. I was really impressed with that turnout. I didn't know it was gonna be, you know, that big. The, the attendance was impressive. Like that was something that really surprised me. Um, so people are clearly like very engaged and seem to be committed to um, the planning process. It's, it's a 12 plus month process that we go through. Um, we work with an advisory committee. Uh, we have around 20 or so that uh, signed up to get more involved from our first public kickoff meeting. So we meet with them monthly uh, to go through the planning process. There's a lot of data on the front end. We look at a lot of a lot of the map mapping that we use uh, for the demographics, for the, the economy. So we look at the the median income level. We look at the age of the, the neighborhood, um, the value of the home. So we really look at all that information to kind of get a feel for where it is today so we can see how it improves or changes in the future. Um, but it was a pretty young neighborhood uh, compared to the city overall. Um, housing values are, are less here than overall. So you can see that it's, it's been declining. They seem to still be very concerned with the, the issue of housing, the condition of the building stock. A lot of people just, you know, right out say there's drugs, there's, you know, a lot of uh, loose animals, um, abandoned houses, you know, houses are just need to be turned down, dirty alleys. Traffic accidents is an issue. Uh, speed of the traffic that comes through the, the corridors through San Jacinto are, are some of the things they'd like to see addressed. Also, uh, homeless population and some of these abandoned houses being used by uh, vagrants that could maybe start a fire and uh, damage the damage the house if they're in there uh, overnight. Uh, part of this process, we actually have regular meetings with our departments um, to learn more what their process is, what they want to see uh, changed. If there's codes we can change, is it staffing? Um, is it just getting more information out to the community on how to report those issues? But there is, of course, a process that goes along with it. If somebody has a a house that's in a poor condition, they have uh, a chance to bring it up to code, bring it up to where it needs to be. So it's a lot of uh, explaining what the process is so they have an understanding of what it takes to actually address those issues. As housing houses age, um, if they're not taken care of, they do get to a point that can you save them or can you not, and what amount of money needs to be invested. Um, and it's also just the neighborhood as a whole, what, what's that investment look like for the investors that own multiple houses? Can they continue to put the money into it and regain what they're putting into it? Is it worth the investment to continue? So it's, it's really a balance that you want to be able to continue to, to grow that neighborhood and see that reinvestment, but ultimately they're only going to put in what they know they can get their profit back. So it's kind of a balancing act um, to try and bring the neighborhood up as a whole. We've had discussions with the, the larger property owners and it's and they'll tell you right up there right right in the beginning of the conversation they don't take care of the properties necessarily what somebody is, that's living there on a day-to-day -day basis, a homeowner that owns a property, they may check on the property once a month or something to make sure it's getting mowed, but it's not really that pride of ownership that you might see from somebody that's uh, owns a property. 
and is living there. So having that turnover of tenants and renters um, can have an impact on the neighborhood. Alleys are another big concern that they'd like to see addressed as far as just the, the legal dumping activity that we see. Um, they're also big into the committees showing a big interest in sustainability um, and practices as far as um, drainage and runoff and, and how we can address some of those issues. Community gardens has come up quite a bit too. Uh, they actually have one here locally with uh, Square Mile that's done their uh, urban farming. So they like to see more of that as well, just to continue to grow um, grow their local businesses too. They don't wanna be a, have chains come in and, and kind of take over. They wanna continue that local business entrepreneurship that you've seen on Route 66. Well, I think addressing the community's concerns about um, public safety really is the first step. I think that um, the, the perception has to start to change in this neighborhood. That has to be where we start. Um, and then once um, we start to see some progress in those areas, I think that the other, um, the other opportunities that the neighborhood has identified that they want um, will be much easier to achieve. There is a lot of, like I said, a lot of concerns from the community. And I think now we're at a point where like, okay, we know what's wrong, um, but now I'm excited to see what the next step is. Like I said, this is my first time doing anything, so um, I'm just showing up and trying to make anything possible. They wanna see um, Route 66 continue to um, be a highlight of the neighborhood as far as the, the character and the uniqueness about it. Um, one thing around that is parking. Uh, it's kind of limited as far as parking goes, so they'd like to see uh, that address, which is part code requirements, part what we do with an existing neighborhood that has limited parking. That's why you plan, um, is you have to look comprehensively at the area. Um, in commercial districts, often you have to have some sort of shared parking. Um, so, you know, identifying uh, potential lots that um, would make sense for a shared parking program, signage, again, education, directing people to those public lots um, can really go a long ways. This is one of the most interesting stretches of Route 66 that I've ever been on. Um, I think the like the integrity of the building style, I love the scale um, of these buildings. I just think it's a really interesting um, district architecturally and of course the history is so rich and um, really could be um, you know we we could be one of those case studies or best practices that um, preservationists across the country are pointing to as far as um, preserving Route 66 and having it be a, a not just a tourist destination but also a district that locals love and um, frequent. So jobs in the neighborhood, how would you mm -hmm. even begin to look at that? Um, part of this one, we've actually included a little bit to the east of San Jacinto, not your more traditional San Jacinto uh, area, that would possibly have some opportunities, some more uh, industry, heavy commercial type uses that could benefit the neighborhood. Um, but you're right, uh, Route 66 is pretty much uh, the way it is, so it's gonna be working um, Maybe it's a, a different zoning district that allows more mixed uses versus what they have now that allows more opportunity of a less parking parking requirements or something to be more flexible to allow allow for that redevelopment to occur and allow those businesses to, to thrive in the neighborhood. How far east are we talking about? It's it's heading towards downtown, but it's kind of that area that's not really downtown, not really San Jacinto, so it was a it was important as through this planning process to, to try and capture a good area that made sense for the neighborhood plan area. It also matches up with the school district's boundary as far as which ones go to the San Jacinto school. So it made sense. There's a lot of history uh, in San Jacinto. So we spent a lot of time talking about historic Route 66 and just um, where the neighborhood's been and what it's gone through. Um, this hasn't really been their first planning process. They've shared with us documents from the past uh, 50, 60 years that they they go through these different uh, iterations of trying to improve the community. So this is our latest effort and hopefully we'll be able to make a difference and work on some of the things they'd like to see. But there's a lot of passionate folks in this neighborhood and a lot of people that want to see it um, be revived. For me, it's not, if it's just when um, for this neighborhood, and so 
Um, I think that you know, starting from the commercial core and co kind of working out um, is really, um, you know, sort of the, the, the starting point for the neighborhood. What are you learning? Well, um, that this, the, the people do have a voice. I mean, you know, these community meetings uh, for the people that show up, you see the passion that is really in this neighborhood still. I've learned that uh, we can do this, you know, this can be possible to revitalize this communi community, um, but it's gonna take everybody. Well, it's really, a, it's got short, medium, and long range goals that they'll work on, but it's really a 20, 20 year plan as far as their vision of what they wanna see San Jacinto look like in 20 years. One of the reasons I came here is because of Route 66. I think that that is just an incredible asset for Amarillo and um, underutilized, and so I think, um, with that corridor running through this neighborhood, um, I think that is such an asset to build off of. But I see a lot of potential in this neighborhood. There's a lot of passionate people um, that care, still care about this community, and so I, I see a lot of I see a lot of bright future. Life is hard, and when life is hard and you have health problems, it's much more difficult. My name's Alan Keister, and I want to welcome you to Heal the City Free Clinic. About 10 years ago, I started doing medical mission trips down to Central America. And when I would go on those trips, uh, I would come back and uh, I would tell people about those trips and the people would look at me and they'd go, you know, your face lights up, you look different when you talk about what happened down there. And so there was a season where I actually thought I might move down there full time and do medical mission type of work. Um, my family did not think that was maybe the best idea. Third world countries did not rank high on their list. And so my calling sort of ended up being right here to the city I grew up in. We started out uh, at the church I was attending uh, back then and we worked with Wolfland Elementary School and we just did simple stuff. Check your blood pressure, check your blood sugar, check your cholesterol. And you know, we had a 250 people show up on that first day. We found a lady that um, had been um, in Afghanistan. She was an Afghanistan refugee, had a blood sugar of 400. So we were able to diagnose her with diabetes, get her diabetes treated. And, you know, maybe one person doesn't end up in the emergency room because we did this clinic. The next one we did was actually right here in San Jacinto neighborhood. We had, uh, we did it on a Thursday night, uh, kind of after school, but connected to the school. Um, also had food brought in, and uh, shockingly about 500 people showed up in a two hours. And um, it was kind of then that we said, well, maybe we're on to something, maybe we need to do something here in this neighborhood. Um, we asked the question, you know, where had most of these people gotten their health care? And so a lot of them had not had any health care in a number of years. Several of them had gotten their health care through um, the emergency room, um, and some of them had, you know, different clinics that they'd attended, but the majority of them did not have any regular sort of health care, and the majority of them didn't have any health care insurance. I, I think the thing about San Jacinto is this. Um, I was amazed um, that there were a lot of people who um, lived in this neighborhood that struggled with poverty in ways um, that I saw struggling with poverty even in a third world country. And to me, having grown up in Amarillo and maybe lived, eaten, breathe in a quarter uh, of Amarillo, I didn't recognize there were people that were really struggling in ways that um, I hadn't seen, you know, other than outside of this country. And so um, to me, I think recognizing that there were people right here where I live that are struggling. We ended up having a little bit of a town hall meeting um, with uh, several of the parents over there at the school. And I just said, this is what we're thinking about, but we really want your input. Where's a, where's a place that you feel comfortable, that you trust? And so um, the place that they came up with was Generation Next Church. And I'd never met Pastor Tommy before, but I called him up and I said, hey, let's go to lunch, I have a crazy idea. And you know, that was the beginning of a really great relationship. So he said, you know, I have this little house out behind my 
um, behind my church and we use it as a youth house. And, and so, yeah, we set up just a one night a week clinic. We'll see the first, you know, 20 people, 25 people that show up and we're just gonna try and help you. I've been with the clinic since I first opened in 2014. We were one block to the west and we were in a 1400 square foot house that we had four exam rooms that were separated by curtains. And you literally couldn't turn a complete circle without bumping into your neighbor. You know, we thought this is gonna be great. We're gonna serve, you know, a thousand patients a year. Well, we outgrew that, that space um, in two weeks and we stayed there for two years. <laughs> We've grown really rapidly. So we just celebrated five years. Um, our staff has literally gone from five last year to 26 at this point. In 2019, we're on track to do 18,000 patient encounters and a, um, close to 20,000 prescriptions by the end of the year. The city generously gifted us this building and now it's gone under transformation itself. Now we're able to serve a ton of people. We are serving 44 counties. So we service Texas, of course, Randall, Potter County, but they're also coming from New Mexico and Oklahoma um, for access to health care. It's about 30% of Amarillo does not have health insurance. So there's a lot of people that need access to health care. Monday is our acute care day. So anybody that can come um, to us at 1.30 on any Monday, we have a variety of resources here. Um, the one stipulation is you can't have any type of health insurance. Um, so Monday is acute care. Um, this last Monday, we saw 168 patients. Uh, we range from um, high blood pressure to diabetes to a sore throat, ear infection. We also have dental that um, we'll see here. We'll see about 14 patients in our, that will be outsourced to outside dentist office that can receive treatment. We also have eye care here. So we have optometrists that come, do eye exams, and they receive glasses here. And then of course, the mental health collaboration. So that's on Monday. On Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is our chronic care program. Those patients have set appointments so they don't stand in line waiting to be seen. And um, we really engaged them in taking ownership of their health. So um, they agree to um, come on to uh, onto the Shalom Clinic program. They're committed to showing up for their appointments, um, taking their medication, if we refer them, showing them, showing up to wherever we refer them to, and then also participating in at least two wellness classes a month. And so what we've seen is as we've engaged these patients that um, have been disconnected um, and have been isolated, if you will, what happens is they come here and all of a sudden they're held responsible and Shockingly enough, they go, okay, I want to be invested in my health. And, and for those who don't, we dismiss them from Shalom Clinic because we want everybody to come out and, you know, ahead. We want them to, to see a, a real sort of whole person care that gets to happen here. And what's been happening with that is that I show up for these wellness classes and they meet somebody and then somebody will say, hey, um, I'm going to go to walking class this week. Why don't you meet me for that? Or I'm going to go to Zumba this week or sit yoga. And so all of a sudden, these disconnected people end up finding community in an odd place in a medical clinic. But what we're seeing is the outcomes are incredible. Like we see better blood pressure control, better diabetes control, better weight loss. I think that that's something that we offer for our patients here is a chance to um, connect with each other and to realize that they're not alone and that they can do this and we believe in them and um, they in turn start to believe in us and believe in themselves and that goes a long way. I've seen all kinds of transformations. I've seen staff transform transformation, I've seen volunteer transformation and of course patient transformation. Um, even providers, you know, they get into medicine. They get to come here and they're not, you don't have to worry about the billing and the coding. It's all about serving people and why they went into medicine in the first place. And so it's a contagious environment. Like we call it sticky. Once you come, you don't wanna leave. And that, that says a lot. My faith is a, is a deep part of why I did this. I feel like I've been blessed in ways that I certainly don't deserve. And so one of the ways that I can say thanks is to give back. Hi, I'm Nolan Hill. I've lived all over the country, and a few months ago, I pulled up stakes and moved here. 
And now I'm showing you the Texas Panhandle with fresh eyes. Welcome to the View from the Hill. In April 2019, Bob G. and Devi Yalamancelli founded Keep Amarillo Clean, an educational initiative to reduce plastic usage, to encourage eco-friendly products, and to keep the city litter-free. With their citywide cleanup days, the Yalamancellis say Keep Amarillo Clean has inspired citizens of all ages to come together and to take pride in their neighborhoods. Uh, my name is Robin Ferris, and I joined Keep Amarillo Clean organization back in the sp spring. Um, I actually had a conversation with Mayor Nelson one time about what we do in the city for litter, and she's the one that connected me with Bob G and his wife, Debbie. And um, so that's how I got involved with the organization. So I just have a passion for keeping Amarillo clean and litter free. My name is Bob G. Yalamanchelli. My name is Devi Yalamanchelli. <laughs> well, we went to Japan. It was a very, very clean country. And uh, you found out that uh, the school children are taught that way to keep it clean. And so when they're grown up, you know, they're very, very, you know, uh, conscious about the environment. But when we came back, you know, we see trash everywhere. Like, so the only way we can solve that problem is involving the community. And uh, our goal is to involve actually the students at this point, because they, change, they can change the society, you know, if you train them properly. Well, we started this organization just to clean up our city. You know, there's plenty of trash around, and it has been thrown around by the winds. Uh, some areas just don't look good. So we want to make a difference uh, by starting the organization. We did the first one back in the spring, and we had a pretty good turnout, but we've done a lot of um, communicating and a lot of publicity with um, the city of Amarillo and churches and schools and businesses. So we hope that the one in September, uh, this coming Saturday, will be even bigger and better. So we're really hoping a lot of people come out and we can make a big impact so that the residents of Amarillo can really see what an impact their help can make. Well, we're asking uh, many people to uh, adopt a, a square mile, you know. So we have success with that. And also, uh, this time the schools are participating all the high, high schools school. and uh, middle schools. So they're taking one square area. That's a good thing. That means, uh, you know, we almost uh, half the squares are, you know, adopted basically. Right. Next year, most likely, the elementary schools are also, also going to be involved. Right. Maybe next uh, spring. Because we have about 60 square mile area to be cleaned, and there are 55 schools. So it's, it's, it's you know, it's very close to, you know, Full circle, basically. If the children learn how to, you know, clean, keep it clean, uh, then their children will learn it, and their children will learn it. So you're teaching the whole generations. I think if you start with children and teach them at a young age, it becomes a habit, and a positive habit. They learn about um, keeping their city clean and litter-free. They learn about um, how litter impacts the 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 drainage systems and our wildlife. I mean, if there's so much litter and we have a big rain, it clogs the drains and then you have flooding. Um, and just the unsanitary aspect of it all, teach kids at a young age to take pride in their city and keep it clean. Because it's the students that are, that are going to be helped, the children that are going to be helped in the long run, uh, we're not going to be here, but they're going to be there for another generation. And, uh, so it's going to help them more than it does us. I think in your day-to-day -day life, when you go to take out your trash, put it in a bag, tie it up, and close the dumpster lid. If you leave the dumpster lid open, it's going to blow out and get into the neighborhood. Um, and again, if you're just walking across a parking lot into a business, you see some trash on the ground, just take an extra second, pick it up, and throw it away. Another thing I think that people can do is use reusable grocery bags instead of plastic bags when they go to the grocery store. It's important to me, again, because I want to take pride in Amarillo. I want to be proud of where I live, and I want it to be clean, I want it to be beautiful, and I think the majority of people want the same thing. Um, we want to be a city that can be a leader in, in our country and not one that has a litter problem. 
Well, my aim is to teach these children. That's my goal, actually, you know. Because when I saw the Japan, they were taught the right way. Why can't we teach the right way here? You know, they, they can change the society in the long run. You know. it, it's not going to happen overnight, but it will change. I, litter has always been a pet peeve of mine, and it just frustrates me when I see people uh, throwing things out their car windows or just down in a parking lot. So when I learned that we had an initiative starting in Amarillo, I wanted to get involved, and um, I just want to do all I can to encourage the Amarillo residents to get involved in keeping Amarillo clean. Pushing up, pushing up, through the dirt just like a seed, but you're never quite a flower. You feel more just like a weed, driving through, driving through. You want to know where you are going, but the windshield's always dirty, and you never get to see what makes you think that you'll ever get there. What makes you think you deserve to know who are you really? Are you so important? Take a look around and watch the world unfold. Watch the world unfold. Watch the world unfold. Watch the world unfold. It is spinning, an identity unhinged. Where to turn, where to turn? There's so many opinions, and they're all a little different. And the outlook's getting dim. What makes you think that you'll ever get there? What makes you think you deserve to know? Who are you really? Are you so important? Take a look around. And watch the world unfold. Watch the world unfold. Watch the world unfold. Watch the world unfold. <laughs> Feel more just like a weed.